Okay, so we are going to talk about two sample tests. So the whole idea of two sample tests is when you have two things you're going to test against. Um, you haven't heard because I haven't finished the update on it, but when you're doing these tests, yes, you could do it the big, annoying, complicated way that they show in here, or you could find the T value or Z value and look it up on a chart. I don't care which way. Um, please, please, please learn to use computers to find these values because it's easier to do so. And honestly, outside of a math class, there's no point. So don't do it. Use computers. Computers are there. They're great tools and they do exactly what they want. Because the main thing of this, and this is going to be the, you know, the thing that I emphasize, it's all about how you interpret what you get that's important for statistics. Um, yeah, that said, if anyone wants to see it, if so wait to the YouTube and stop it. Um, <coughs> learning objectives, because I don't know, they think you're in high school. Um, I don't, I don't know. So, we can do, essentially, this whole thing is about we could do statistics on two samples as well as one sample with a known mean. Uh, a couple of basic assumptions is, and this is kind of important because these are the assumptions that you need to do to do tests. And they're really kind of important. Uh, one is your two populations have to be random. We had to be able to grab two random samples. So you cannot cheat and do something that is specifically that you're trying to test against. That doesn't work. I have to have a random sample. Um, those populations have to be independent. I can't do a population within a different population and they're somehow associated with each other's. So I couldn't, so for instance, if I'm trying to find the percentage of wins within a blackjack table, I probably shouldn't do that at the same casino. And I really should not do that because a lot of times if a blackjack dealer is really good, like really good, they can influence results. So to be truly independent, I should probably choose them from different casinos so that the, the chances of you know, cheating and different things within the system gets eliminated because it's two different casinos. Um, and here's the big and, both of my populations are normal. I have to do this with a normal population. Uh, and this is where a lot of the statistics comes in. This is where a lot of math comes in because we could take stuff that's not normal and either apply the central limit theorem to assume normality or more likely, especially when some of the data we have, we can apply uh, mathematical transformations to the data to have those be normal. Uh, so a popular one is a log plus one. So log plus one is when you have a lot of very low numbers and it kind of follows the Poisson distribution, you apply a log plus one and it kind of squishes everything down into the right. So you still have a lot of you know very low values, but it goes from here to here. Uh, that kind of thing really helps and it lets you do some of these tests that you couldn't normally do. So just be aware. So, that's the formula. We do the z-score is equal to the difference of the population means the difference of the means that you have, the, or the test values minus the means you have over the standard deviation or over the, sorry, the square root of the standard deviation over the uh, sample size plus st st uh, standard deviation over the second sample size. Nice and fun formula. Uh, easy, easy, easy to, to plug in if you really want to in Excel. If you want to use it, MATLAB. Um, if you're going to do this in one of the other programs, there are literally just functions where you just put in the populations and it calculates everything for you. Uh, those are easy. 
I would I usually recommend using those if you can. Um, I don't know if MATLAB has a specific t test or z test in there, but this is specifically for the one you have a known variance. So if we have that variance, we can calculate it. It's important because it lets us see. Uh, essentially, you end up building 95% confidence intervals is what we're looking at. We're going to try to see how close they are to each other and all that nonsense. Um, this is also assuming right here that has a standard or a normal distribution. It's always going to assume a normal distribution. So that's why we do it a z-score. If you have a normal distribution, that's, you know, z. So if our null hypothesis is there's no difference between group A and group B. So they have it as uh, the change in O is equal to the difference in the mean. Uh, I ne never like that. Personally, I like the fact that the mean of group one is equal to the mean of group two. And the alternative is that they're not equal or less than or greater than, depending on what I want. <coughs> depends on what you want, depends on how you phrase it, once again, everything. Uh, so we use the test statistic here, same thing we just talked about, uh, to find our z-score and then go and look up our probability based on that. So alternative is not equal to, greater than or less than, uh, and we just look for, once again, we choose our z-score based on whether it's a two-tailed test, which would be alpha divided by two, or a one-tailed test, which would be alpha. So z of alpha, z alpha divided by two. Just which one do you have? Then you go up on the table or use any of the various programs to look up the z, the a significance based on the z-score that you calculate. <sighs> Why do they choose some of these stuff? So, if anyone has that, the example they give is watching paint dry. You can actually read all this. So, I, it makes sense because, well, this is an engineering problem. If you're trying to figure out how long it takes a primer to dry, it's kind of important if you're actually, you know, a painter. Uh, we generally don't care about an industry standard because there's a lot of things that go into paint and paint dryness. For instance, is the paint going to dry quicker in Arizona or Michigan? It's going to be Arizona because we have what, 10% humidity versus Michigan, which could have between like 50 and 80% humidity. So you can't really just have an industry standard for paints or drying. You could, but it would be dependent on your environment. So instead, we can, you know, look at how paint dries according to where your the location you have. Uh, so they have two formulations of paint and tested. So they have one and uh, which is a standard chemistry. Basically, you go and get paint off the shelf. Uh, formulation two has a new drying ingredient that should reduce drying time see how it looks, but uh, so from experience is known that the standard deviation of drying time is eight minutes. So they give you that information and this inherent variability should be unaffected by the addition of the new ingredients. So you have the same standard deviation for both treatments. Uh, 10 specimens are uh, painted with formulation one and another 10 are done with formulation two. So you have an N1 of 10 and an N2 of 10. Um, the 20 specimens are painted at random order. The two sample averages drying times are uh, 121 minutes and 112 minutes. So sample one, or formulation one, 121, two is 112. Um, what conclusions can you draw about the effectiveness of the new ingredient using alpha at 0.05? <clears throat> My question is, and on this is what null and alternative hypothesis would you choose? Uh, personally, I don't want to wait longer for paint to dry. 
no one wants to do that. So I would choose a one-tailed test where formulation two has a lower drying time than formulation one so that I could see, you know, is it better? That's all I care about. I don't care if it's different. I care if it's better. So the null hypothesis is that the means are different or the same. The alternative is me, uh, formulation two should be less than formulation one. Yes. So the test statistic given here is the difference in the means minus zero because we don't want a difference. <coughs> and we have standard deviation and numbers. And we reject if our value is less than 0 0.05 from the z-score table. So the difference in our drying times, 121 minus 112 is nine. And we have the same thing over here. So eight squared and eight squared is, or eight squared over 10 is 6.4. So 6.4 plus 6.4 square rooted uh, over nine, no, nine over, sorry, 12.8 square rooted would be 2.52. So you could do it or use a computer to do it up to you. That's the, the easy score that we got out of it. Go onto the table. You can either look at 0.05 and see if it's below it, or you can go and just look where 2.52 is more or less on the table. It's up to you, however you want to do it. Uh, but because of the, that, the p-value uh, is whatever is 0.0059. Since that's below 0 0.05, we would reject the null hypothesis. So they're, they are not equal. And because we chose the alternative hypothesis that it's less than, then the new formulation does dry quicker. And that's what it comes down to. We can say we reject the null hypothesis, leaving the alternative because those are the math words. But the practical implication is the new one is dries quicker than the old one. <clears throat> so if uh, the two-sided error or type two error, yes. Depends on your field. It 100% depends on your field. Uh, the alpha value, uh, what's your major? 0.05. 99% of everything you do will be 0.05. Uh, if you're biomedical, uh, genetics, some data scientists, um, if you deal with human health or genetics, it's going to be 0.01 or 0.001. It's going to be really small unless you do specific things. It's called a Bonfroni correction, which is not this class. That's like a, a, literally an advanced statistics or model building or stuff like that class. For majority of people, 0.05 is good because it's a good stand between a type one and a type two error. We like to be able to say, we're more or less gonna be all right. If something goes wrong, it's not up outside of the realm of possibilities. However, when you're dealing with health, so like everyone's seen the vaccines in the market, right? They're using a 0.01 and or a Bonfroni correction to make sure what they have is correct because they don't want to mess around with human health. That's, I mean, same thing with genetics. You don't mess around with genetics because some of the genetic treatments can be very bad. So you want to make sure. And you would rather reject something that could be true than to let something through that could harm you. So it's that, that question is, if I make a mistake, how many people die? And even like electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, whatever, yeah, you could have a very bad thing. Aviation engineers would probably be the, the, the most horrific. Yeah, you can have an error occur, but you're gonna be limited to a couple hundred people. I know that sounds morbid, but it's true. If I mess up with medicine, I affect several thousand to 10,000 to 100,000 people. That's a big uh oh. So who are you affecting? I think the worst mechanical engineering thing I've seen in the United States in the last decade was that bridge down in Florida where someone didn't do the math right. That's about the biggest I've seen. And that was a couple thousand people. Not very fun. Bridge collapsed. Yeah, they didn't follow the engineer's plans. And the bridge collapsed. 
it was going over a highway to Florida International University, I think. Yeah, it wasn't very, and, and, and yeah, that wasn't a very good one. So, um, to find <coughs> the D, so uh, choice of sample size, you could take the absolute value of the difference in the mean over the square root of the, the standard deviations, and that would give you your D for one-sided or two-sided. Uh, the only difference in the two side or one sided versus two side actually is there a difference? There's not a difference between one one sided or two sided, so choose, you can choose your sample size based off of that. Or oh, find your D value. Oh no, that's for finding the D. Sorry, the once to find your sample size. So this is power. So this is the thing that I've been like your best friends later in life. Whenever you get to, you know, tell people, I had to pull this many samples. And they ask if you can make it any smaller, and you're like, no. This is the smallest thing I can do to give you the results you want. Is this guy right here. So uh, if you have two samples and a known variance, what you can do to find the sample size is the uh, Z alpha divided by two plus your Z beta uh, quantity squared plus your standard deviations added together squared over your difference in your means. And if you have a Z zero, that's a delta zero, that's not a non-zero value, possible. And all that's squared. If you have one-sided, you do the same thing, it looks like. Is there, oh no, it's the alpha instead of alpha divided by two. That's the difference for one-sided versus two-sided. Um, this helps. This, uh, it's an annoying formula, but it really does help because it allows you to go in and say, I need, you know, 32 samples to detect what you want me to detect, which is, you know, really important because it saves you money in the long run, saves companies headaches, um, and sets production schedules. I need four samples per shift. Okay, that's doable because you want to do it randomly but you should still at the same time look at the entire issue. This depends on, once again, individual things. <clears throat> so an example of this, um, still watching paint dry. Uh, the true difference of drying times is as much as 10 minutes. Uh, we want to detect this with the probability of 0.9, uh, under the null hypothesis that the mean different or the delta zero is zero. Uh, we have one sided alternative because we could care less if they're different. We just want to see if it's less than. Uh, so we have a delta of 10 because we, we know it's ten, a difference of 10. We have our alpha. So our Z score is 1.645 and our beta is or some the power is 0.9 so beta is 0.1 so right here we have the probability of nine so if you have your alpha beta is one minus that so 0.1 so the z of beta would be i go into the table z score and find out the z score of 0.1 which is 1.28 so 1.645 plus 1.28 quantity squared and i have the same standard deviations of eight so eight squared plus each other, so 128, all that over 100, which gives us a power of 11. So we have to pull 11 samples from each sample. So when you do this, this is, uh, wait, yeah, from each number, because each number on the, uh, Z score originally you have N1 and N2. So you need to pull 11 from each one. Uh, that's what this basically does is I need to find 11 samples. Um, say, say it's exactly the same results that it got from the OC curves. It's really close to the example. The example looks for 10, they had a standard deviation of eight. So even those numbers are all kind of the same. <coughs> If you want to do confidence intervals for some weird reason, because you don't technically have to do Z scores. Um, so this is the weird thing. 
uh, and you can do this a lot, especially if you move on past, um, I hate to say this, if you get lazy later in your career, acceptable, you're tired, that's life, and you ditch coding programs for plug and play. Whatever, I'm not judging, I've done it, sometimes it's easier. Uh, you can build confidence intervals for different populations, and if those populations don't overlap on the confidence interval, they'll be significantly different. That simple. What it comes down to and is if I have essentially two populations. And they go like that with the mean and deviation and that they don't overlap. These don't overlap. I don't know if you see that. So they don't overlap. So we can build a confidence interval for some of these populations. Don't mesh. It goes. Uh, so this is what they do here. So the difference in the means minus your z alpha divided by two times the square root of the standard deviation over the number for each population is less than the difference in it because they're doing the difference. Uh, it's different from the difference, uh, and then they do it on the plus side. So what they're doing, this is what I do, which is I can construct 95% confidence intervals of each population independently. That works. Or you can do this way. If you construct a confidence interval of the two populations combined and you're looking at the mean difference between the two, all you care about is does that confidence interval include zero? If that confidence interval includes zero, in any way, shape, or form, then you are not significantly different. Because it's either going to be one population all the way to the top, one population is going to be all the way to the bottom, something like that. If they overlap, right here, like that, and you have that little bit of right there, that would include zero. There is a chance, however small, that they won't be different that they'll still occupy the same space. That's what that's looking at. So, aluminum tensile strength. So, if you have two different grades of aluminum uh, used in manufacturing of wings of, tra of transport craft, from past experience with uh, the process and the testing procedure, you have a standard deviation uh, can be known, and you have sample size of 10, X bar one of 87.6, a standard deviation of one, or sorry, variance of one, not standard deviation. Sample size of two is 12, 74.5 and 1.5. Um, so this is something that's kind of different. We don't really, they didn't really talk about it, but sometimes you will have sample sizes that are different. Uh, this is one of the reasons you have these guys here, because you can account for differences in sample size, different pooling, different things like that. Uh, if you look online, there is a much simpler formula if you have variances that are equal than if you have variances that are unequal. If you have, because you have different, Standard deviations, your variances there, you have different sample sizes. These change things. Sometimes you'll have the same because that's just what happens. So be aware when you look online, some of the formulas will look differently because they're used for different things, even though they'll say it's the same thing. Uh, so if the mu1 and mu2 is the true mean tensile strengths for the two grades of spars, we, we may find a 90% confidence interval of the difference in mean strength. So they want 90% because they do. Um, sometimes, by the way, your alpha value depends on your boss saying, uh, I'm okay with 90%. Sometimes it does come down to that. It just depends on situation. Um, that's most like the most, there's no mathematical rhyme or reason to some of them. It's just what somebody tells you. 
for me, unless, like I said, you're doing biomedical or medical or something like that, you're doing on everything's going to be 0.05. Unless you're ecology, if you're doing ecology for some bizarre reason, you're at 0.9 probably because they can't grow lakes. Um, so the difference in the means minus the alpha divided by two. So they use that formula there is less than the difference of the mean is less than the differences. Oh, they just moved it down here. Wow, that's bad formatting. So plugging it in, so they have the differences in those two values, which would be 13.1 minus the Z alpha divided by two is 16.45. So we have one squared over 10 and 1.5 over 12. All that square rooted. Then you do it again on the other side. All calculates to be between 12.22 and 13.98. So you have a difference between those two of about 12.2 to almost 14. So looking at those, you can make assumptions, especially when you start looking at price, right? If you start looking at price, what is more important? You know, the strength or the price? Because if you're gonna have a difference in them, you need to figure out what's you know important for your manufacturing process. <coughs> Sample size for this, a little easier, actually a lot easier. Uh, so if uh, for the confidence intervals, uh, difference in means, variance is known. If you know a known error rate that you're okay with, it's going to be Z alpha divided by two over your error rate quantity squared times your standard deviations added together. Uh, once again, N is a number. N is a number. It is not um, a finite number. I need it to be a whole number because you can't have a point or of a ingot. You can't have 2.8 humans, um, which always bothers me when they say the nuclear family, father, son, 2.4 kids. It's like, no. no. Um, this isn't, so all this is ensures the level of confidence does not drop below 100 times one minus alpha. If you want to do one-sided, you do one-sided. The main difference is it's not Z alpha divided by two, it's Z alpha. That's the only difference between the two. Uh, once again, this is all kind of the same formula, just reworked each individual time. Uh, so upper, you add, obviously, because you want the higher value. Lower, you subtract, you want the lower value. So, uh, why do they make these so small? Like seriously, I'd rather have it in two or three slides than be this small. If we have two independent normal populations, yay assumptions, with unknown means and unknown but equal variances, so we have the same variances, and we want to test that the difference in the means is zero and the difference in the or versus not zero, how do we do that? So this uses the idea, or so we have a random sample of n observations from the first population and a random sample from the second. Uh, and we have the sample means and the sample variances respectively from each one. Uh, we could do the expected value of the differences of the sample mean is the expected values of the difference. So the idea is we have an unbiased estimator. So this uses this formula right here. So we assume standard deviation and one over n for both populations. Which gives you pooled estimator of variance. So if uh, this is uh, a way that we can look at two different populations and kind of get a good general estimate of how well 
things are for your S squared value. So degrees of freedom times your S value of the first one plus your degrees of freedom times your S value of the second one, S squared value. All this is over essentially your degrees of freedom for both population combined. So your N1 plus your N2 to minus two. Uh, the reason we use this is this is used in part of a t-test. So this, because we don't have that known standard deviation and we cannot assume the standard deviation of a z-score, we have to use a t-test instead of a z-test. And that's the big difference between the two. When you don't have that zero one, when you don't have the standard deviation and the mean, of a population, you have to use a t-test, <coughs> which means you have to use this guy right here, because you have a sample, but not a population. So the difference in the means, or x, x values over the definitions in the mean, all the over your pooled variance times the square root of one over your n1 and plus one over your n2. Because they like formulas, I don't know. So, a null hypothesis is essentially that the means are the same, even though they use this one instead. We use that t-value of the pooled variance as our test statistics, and then you can choose a normal alternative hypothesis, p-values associated with it, whether it's uh, uh, 0.025 essentially, uh, two-tailed versus 0.05, where you look it up and then how you write them out and find them. So remember with the t-test, you had to look, you had to know the degrees of freedom and you had to know your significance level. So remember there's two lines for the one for the one-tailed and one for the two-tailed. Make sure you know which one you're doing before you do it. So, hey look, chemistry. Um, we have two uh, catalysts. And we're going to look at them to see how they affect the mean yield of a chemical reaction. I don't know why they say process is a reaction. Ugh. So catalyst one is currently in use and we're tracking catalyst two to see if it's better. Or maybe we're checking to see if it's not different. Um, so yes, when they're looking for different. So remember, everything is how you're asking the question. What is acceptable for my situation? Maybe Catalyst 2 is a lot cheaper. Uh, this actually happens a lot with uh, biodiesel, which is, hey, my dissertation. Catalysts are expensive and or put you on lists for the government that you may not want to be on. So we're always looking for ones that are cheaper that don't get you on watchdog lists because a lot of them are used in the production of illegal substances. Yay. Uh, so we like to not have stuff like sodium hydroxide sitting around our yard, our basement, our basement, our you know, garages or anything like that. We want better catalysts, we want cheaper catalysts, we want stuff that is you don't have people at your door asking why you bought 12 tons of you know sodium hydroxide. I don't know why you need that much, but that's the idea. Um the test run of the pilot plant and results of the data are shown here. Uh, is there any difference between the mean yields using a 0.05? Assuming equal variances. So we have our X1, our X2, and we have the S value from each catalyst. <clears throat> so we're gonna run that t-test because we don't know the population variance, because that's unknown. Um, so we're looking at the, the mean for each process. The null is that they're equal. The alternative is that they're not. This is one we do not want to fail or reject the null hypothesis. We're OK with the null hypothesis. The test statistic is using the pooled sample and the differences between the mean values over 1 over n plus 1 plus 1 over n plus 2. And we reject if the p-value is less than that 0.05. So from the beginning, we had known yields, which go up there. But the first thing we had to do is calculate that pooled variance. 
So we take the degrees of freedom from the first, which is seven, and the degrees of freedom from the second, which is seven, and take those individually times your S1 for population one, S2 from population two, which gets us seven times two. Oh, that's squared. What are those values? Because they never actually calculate those values, which always bugs me, by the way. They don't show it all step by step. If we have 2.39 squared, it's 5.71 times seven. So that's 39.9847 on the first one. And then 2.98 squared times seven. So 62-ish plus 39-ish, about 101 to 100, 101 or so on top. And all that's done over 14 which gives us a pooled variance of 7.3. So the difference between the two catalysts, which is a little bit of a negative number, over 2.7 times one over one fourth, square root of one fourth would be uh, one half times 2.7. So you're looking at one half times 2.7 is 1.35. So we have a very small, T score. Um, I don't really have to look it up. I can tell you if you have a T score of negative 0 0.35 right now that it's not going to be significant because you usually have to have that value in the, the, the one to two to three values depending on your sample size. So since the absolute value of T0 because we're doing a two-sided two test it doesn't matter. Uh, we find from attendance uh, table five that the T of 0.4 of uh, 14, so use the number down here, and the pooled variance is our total sample size. So if, real quick, if you want to remember that, this number right down here on the bottom of your pooled variance, when you calculate that, that is your degrees of freedom for the entire model. So when you go to your table, you use that number to find your degrees of freedom. And why does they, they use a 0.4? Why do they use a 0.4? Oh, they were looking up where it is. So they're looking up where it is on here. So 0.4, this value is between 0.4 and 0.25. So that's where your T value lands you, is somewhere in 25 to 40% range. Uh, that's nowhere near 0.05. The other way you could do it is to go to 0 0.05 on the table, look up your degrees of freedom of four. Uh, this is a two-tailed test and see if you are greater than that critical value. Uh, both of them work. It just depends on you know what Wiley wants for your homework. But in real life, you'll just look up, look it up on the table and reject or fail to reject. So since our p-value is not less than 0 0.05, we would reject the null hypothesis. Uh, oh, sorry, we failed to reject an all hypothesis. So there's no difference between catalyst one and catalyst two, which is kind of what we wanted, so. <clears throat> if we don't have known variances, we have to use this guy right here. Uh, so we, this is also important if we don't have, um, different variances if we think that's going to be a difference so like um somebody was doing this for i don't remember if it's this you guys are thursday somebody was going to look at field goal percentages for regular season versus playoffs this is a good example because how how well are you going to guard someone on regular season when you have like 82 games in the nba versus the playoffs you're gonna be a little bit more hyper vigilant in the playoffs right so the field goal percentage should go down. So I should have a different variance because of how the situation works. Um, another uh, example would be, I'm sorry, I do sports. Hockey gets insane in the playoffs. I cannot compare the stats during the regular season to the stats in the playoffs because people literally will break bones in order to win games. So they're going to be a little bit different intensity and attention to detail. That's why you get 
won zero games where you lose and stop 73 shots. I'm not bitter about that game two years ago or anything. Um, so you have different S values. You have different variances. You can't use the same test. So you still do the difference in the X values over the S over N, S versus N. So the difference between the two, uh, you, what is it? It's distributed approximately with T with degrees of freedom given by. So they give a V value of S of two over N of one. So you take the same thing over here, remove the square root essentially and square it. Oh, this is calculating the variance over this value over your degrees of freedom plus this value over your degrees of freedom. Uh, and this is not an integer, so you will round down. <coughs> this is actually a project that I know they're doing this. Um, at Phoenix College, they are working with this data to the Arizona Department of Air and Water Quality. Uh, we made the news in not a good way. Uh, our water is kind of trash. I don't know if you know that, right? Um, but it's been worse. In 2001, uh, we had high concentrations of arsenic. So in Metro Phoenix, we had, uh, Gilbert was at 25 parts per billion. Lendell had 10, Mesa 15. Scottsdale was really bad at 25. But these were relatively good, because if you go out here to rural, Rim Rock had 48 parts per billion. Goodyear has 44. New River had 40. Apache Junction had 48. It was really, really bad. So, dear person, would you rather live in rural, like rural water quality alone, not anything else? Would you rather live in rural Arizona or urban Arizona? By the way, there's reasons for this, and I'll tell you after the problem. <clears throat> so, what we care about uh, is the mean arsenic concentrations for the two geographic regions, um, mu1 and mu2. Uh, we are interested, basically, are, are they different? Ideally, um, I would want them to be the same. But it also depends on really what you're looking at. Uh, so the null hypothesis is that they're the same. The alternative hypothesis is that they're different. I don't know if it's good or bad. I'm just interested if it's different. Uh, so our test statistic is using the T0 because we don't know the reasons. We don't, the setting in a rural environment, for, especially for water quality, is completely different than an urban. So we cannot assume equal variances. So we reject that if the degrees of freedom, uh, the, uh, so we could find the degrees of freedom by plugging into this. So that's what you're doing. You don't have any idea how many sample sizes, so we could find it. So you plug everything into here. Ugh. So we have the, uh, did they give us data? Oh yeah, right here. 12.5, 7.63, 27.5 to 15.3. So we plug those into here, do all the math, and we end up with, once again, we run down a degrees of freedom of 13. The reason that's important is because these are really different. And the fun thing is they don't tell you how many samples they've actually drawn from both of these. Um, because these are kind of amalgamated and the US uh, EPA has weird reporting things where they don't really care how many times you did it. They want like your highest or they want your average or they want whatever they want at the time. So to do this test, you need to find your degrees of freedom, which uses this guy right here. So we have an alpha of 0.05 because 0.05. And with fixed significant level test, we would reject the null hypothesis if we are over off based off of this number and that 
since it's a two-tailed test, alpha divided by 2, uh, 0.025, so we find at 2.16. We could just calculate the critical point. That's really what we end up doing. Um, or you do it at the negative end. So this will be, if you're doing a two-tailed test, it's always going to be plus or minus that T of alpha divided by 2. So then you plug in a chunk, right? Plug it into your computer, get your answer. Uh, so the mean difference is a lot of negatives over 7.63 squared over 10 plus 15.3 squared over 10 square rooted, which gives us a negative 2.77. Well, because we already calculated back here, 2.16 plus or minus is our critical T, we would reject the null hypothesis, meaning there is a difference in arsenic levels between rural and urban Arizona. And here's what they didn't tell you. Uh, the rock down and around Yuma and in the mountainous regions of Arizona naturally contain arsenic. So this whole story was kind of trumped up based on the geography of Arizona. And essentially what it's done is it made the, um, some of these wells literally have three people who drink from them. Like literally, I, I looked at the numbers, they have three users. Uh, and they don't ever actually drink from them. It's usually used for cattle or sheep or livestock or agriculture. Um, so a lot of these data is highly skewed, which they don't tell you. But when I talk to them and I, because my one of my classes uh, ran this data, they found out essentially that's why is because they always were high. They have been historically high for years. And the Arizona Republic got a hold of it and said, that doesn't seem right. And then instead of talking to someone like a geologist, the statisticians or anyone there, they ran the, the thing saying, we have really bad water. Talk to people. That's why one of the things I harp upon, especially because that was 2001, is science education. Uh, that's one of the reasons my blood pressure is so high is because I have to deal with people who will not listen to reason whenever I talk about my fields of interest, which is statistics, genetics, and agriculture, which are not good places to be experts in, by the way, for your blood pressure. So, anywho, for our D, we could do essentially delta or minus delta is not over two alpha, or two, sorry, two sigma. So our variance times two, over basically our delta. So going back to the cat, the catalyst example, um, if catalyst two produces a mean yield that differs from the mean yield of catalyst one by 4%, uh, we would like to reject the null hypothesis for probability of at least 0.85. So what sample size do we need? Uh, we have the pooled variance of 2.7 as an estimate for the common standard deviation right there. And uh, we have a D of alpha divided by, or delta divided by two standard deviations. So four, which is the 4%, uh, divided by two times 2.7 or 0.74. We go right up to the chart. Uh, D of 0.74, beta of 0.15, which is one minus your probability. And we find a sample size of 20. Uh, therefore, because n is equal to 2n minus 1, because we're looking at degrees of freedom, um, we end up with 11, because we have to round. Um, which makes sense, because if we have a degrees of freedom, you always add, they make it out harder than it has to be. You add one to each side. So if you split it down the middle, that's your degrees of freedom, you just add one. They make it harder than it is. Two samples, equal sample size. Degrees of freedom, add one. I don't know why they do that, but um, <clears throat> if you have equal variances, you can basically do, uh, oh God, why do they have this so small? Um, you have 
Uh, you can build your confidence interval as the difference between the two means minus your T alpha divided by two of your degrees of freedom of both populations times your two times your pooled uh, S times one over N1, our square root of one over N1 plus one over square root or N2 is less than the difference. And that's also equal to the same thing, but plus. So you do the same thing on both sides. Uh, once again, when you do this, probably what you're trying to calculate is this part right here. So grab your T value, <clears throat> calculate your pooled variance using this or in this formula here. And this you should have calculated anyway. You put them all together, plus and minus. Once again, most of this stuff is basic algebra. It's just the formulas are not fun. Um, that's why you use a computer because someone spent time to code it for you, use their work. Uh, so if I'm looking at cement hydration, because why not? Uh, anybody taken civil engineering? Have you taken the wonderful concrete class? Oh God. Do they have a concrete class here? Sorry, that's the one thing. That's the, I, I went to uh, Missouri Science and Technology the first time. And that's the one class, even though I know it was a killer, I wanted to kind of take concrete and cement because it just seemed like, what are you taking this semester? Cement. Anywho. <laughs> uh, so if you have standard cement with an average weight percent of calcium of 90 and a stamp, sample standard deviation of five and an end of 15 of the lead doped cement, with an average weight, wow, who wrote this thing? Uh, so your second one, which is lead doped, uh, has an X, uh, sorry, mean of 87, standard deviation of sample of four, and I, so they say 10 of the first, 15 of the second, got it. They really not write to save their lives, can they? So assuming the weight percent calcium is normally distributed uh, with the same standard deviation, you find the confidence interval, 95%. Um, so you had to calculate your pooled variance, which is your uh, degrees of freedom. So 10 minus one of nine times five squared or 25. So 225 plus uh, 16 times 14. I'm not gonna do that math in my head. Uh, you add those together and you do that over your degrees of freedom for your entire thing, which is 23. Uh, would give you a pooled sample variance of 19.52. Sorry, that's S squared. Uh, take the square root of that and your pooled variance is 4.4. Pooled standard deviation, pooled variance. So from that, find the difference in the means, which would be three minus your T uh, alpha divided by two of 0.025, because it's a two-tailed, times your degrees of, uh, based on your degrees of freedom, which gives you 2.069 plus and minus, times that 4.4 times the square root of 1 tenth plus 1 15th, all square rooted. Uh, that one I'm not doing in my head. Sorry, guys, I'm not, yeah. Gives you plus or minus, uh, sorry, do that plus and minus, gives you between negative 0 0.072 and 6.72. So this, once again, once you have this, because this contains zero, it goes from a negative to a positive in the 95% confidence interval, you can't be sure that these two concretes are different. So this is what I was talking about before. When your 95% confidence interval contains zero, like in this case, they will not be significantly different. Um, so it's a way to run a T test or a P test without actually running it because you have the values that say, well, I can't be sure they're different. Um, how much time we have? Seven. So case two, we have two standard deviations, uh, they're not equal. In many situations, assuming this is not really reasonable because you can't be sure of everything in the environment. It happens a lot. Uh, 
when the assumption is unwarranted, we still may find uh, the uh, confidence interval on uh, the difference using the wonderful formula is distributed approximately as t with degrees of freedom v but by the equation back before. So we could still find it. It's just we have to assume that it's not equal. So the big difference is, if you see here, before we had that SOP, we had the pooled variance. This one does not. Uh, so we're still doing the T alpha divided by two times V, or for based on V because we calculated the V, but we don't put the pooled variance in front of it. V is given by well, 10.6. Where's the, this right here. So we had to calculate the degrees of freedom using the wonderful fun formula right here in order to look it up on the T. So whenever you don't have your degrees of freedom or you had to find it, you use that V to calculate it. <clears throat> so, Going on to the Wilcoxon rank sum test. How much do I have? I'm not 30. You know what? Do you guys want to go anymore? Or are you okay with the, finding the rest on YouTube? Is your brain's fried? Or are you good? Or I could do this. If I stop now, I can answer questions for like 10, 15 minutes or help with homework. That, okay. Let me stop share. <laughs>